Welcome to the Boom YouTube, YouTube channel. We are the writers of the Boom, which means that we invite uh, writers of the Boom generation to join us in reading their work and sharing their creative journeys and their writing secrets. So uh, today we're really pleased to welcome um, oh, Robert Miltner. And you'll see his screen says Molly Fuller. And that's his, po his wife, who's also a poet, who is his web administrator for today. So anyhow, we're really, really happy to have um, Robert with us today. And I'm good. so Robert, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and to see you, you two again. <laughs> yes, yes. We know each other, by the way, from the Boom Project book, which is this book right yeah. here, yeah. in which we were pleased to publish uh, an essay by Robert Miltner. Um, and we didn't know at the time that he was primarily a poet, although when we read the piece, I can remember Bonnie and I saying, well, this reads like poetry in places. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it goes back to my view that I think sometimes the best essayists are poets because oh, they know how to use words and they yeah. know how to use them succinctly, but yeah. Yeah. perfectly. Yeah. So I'll tell you a little bit about Robert to begin with. I've got a, a, bio, a bio statement here. First of all, you know, uh, he is, as I said, in the Boom Project book, which is Voices of a Generation, and it is an anthology by Bonnie Johnson and myself. Um, he also has numerous books of pro prose poetry, Hotel Utopia by New Rivers Press, Orpheus and Echo by Etruscan Press, Against the Simple by Kent State University Press, and Eurydice, uh, Eurydice. Eurydice. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an essayist and not a poet. Eurydice Rising by Redberry Fine Press Editions. Yeah. And his collection of brief fiction is And Your Bird Can Sing by Bottom Dog Press. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're, we've invited him today to share with us his collection of creative nonfiction, which is Ohio Apertures. Yes, in unison. And I'll read you. Just like we practiced. <laughs> I, we, no, we, of course we didn't. <laughs> but yes, um, we're, it looks like he's really got something here. I'll read you the blurb. We all, you know, if, if you're a writer, you have to have a blurb, right? So this is a wonderful blurb. It's two dozen selections, which include flash memoir, lyric essays, narrative nonfiction, literary nonfiction, travel writing, and historical excavations of a place. Tracing the author's life from early childhood onward, offering a template for understanding the impact of place, region, family, literacy, and cultural influence on the shaping of a Midwest identity. Yeah. That does that pretty well say it? I guess it does. Okay. <laughs> so do you want to add anything to the bio statement? I know you were a professor at Kent State or still well, are? No, I'm retired from Kent retired? State. Retired? Okay. I also taught in the Northeast Ohio um, MFA and Creative Writing Program, Kent State. Yeah, University of Akron, Youngstown State, and Cleveland State was a consortium wow. program. Um, and the, that was like I did the last uh, this decade of my career at Kent State was working across a region. And that, that interestingly, I think had some effect on this. I was, I, I was really aware of the fact that we, we were running an MFA program <laughs> against a, off a quarter of a whole state. Um, <laughs> And so um, it was really interesting to get to know a lot of the, particularly the people in Youngstown. I, I knew some, some professors out there, but the, the whole regional aspect of it was coming into sharp focus. And I was seeing a lot of that in the student writing too, so. That's good. So do you miss teaching at all or not? Oh gosh, um, I miss parts of it, I guess. Um, yeah. But I'm doing other things now that are, are relative to that. I'm working, um, uh, on a literary festival at uh, Youngstown State University, which is done through Lit Youngstown, that is has a lot of strong connections with MFA people, and uh, it's been a really good community project for Molly and I. Because sure. while we can't get, haven't been getting out in the world, but we, we're finally able to start now as we're getting our, our vaccinations. Um, um, and interestingly, the Ohio Apertures book was 
through Cornerstone Press at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And it's, it's actually an undergraduate publishing class. And oh, so interesting. An interaction with the students along the way. Uh, there was a student editor I worked with uh, uh, and so many of the people involved in the project were undergraduates. Um, the Hotel Utopia book I did was at um, um, Minnesota State University Moorhead and that was an MFA student press. So um, the working with the press at, uh, at uh, Stevens Point was really interesting for me to be working again with students, but I didn't have to grade anything. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good thing. Yeah, Bonnie and I understand that grading thing and the college yeah. students. Yes, that's wonderful. You know, it seems to me you're drawn to, to undergraduates and, and graduates. You're drawn to people who are learning, yeah. which yeah. is good because yeah. you're with us. And even though we're boomers, we're still learning, right? Oh, they have so much good energy. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. They do. They, they do. do. They do. And it's really, it's really catching. You know, it, really yes, handy. Yeah. Wonderful. And it's a beautiful book, Thank really, you. and nicely done. So tell them congratulations. So uh, what have you chosen to read to us today? Uh, after we've talked a little bit, I'm going to read the piece uh, about Alsace because I, this is funny. You know, I, when, I, when I do a book of poetry, I will have read a lot of the poems along the way. Um, but a project like this, I wasn't reading any of the work. I think one of the first pieces of nonfiction actually that, that I did read uh, was the one I read uh, in Louisville. <laughs> and that was the first time I read that aloud. And so I'm doing these readings now and for the first time I'm actually hearing myself read them. Not that I didn't read them out aloud many times in the revision process because I think that's absolutely critical and that, mm -hmm probably comes from my training as a poet because there's so much attention to, to sound and cadence and inflection. Uh, but I'm actually reading a lot of these pieces out loud for the first time and it's really, really pretty interesting. So I'm gonna do this one. Uh, I'm gonna read this, it's called Out of Alsace. And uh, as we talked about before we started um, this, um, my mother late in her life uh, wrote down some memories of her family and I, I learned a lot of family history that I didn't really know about on my mother's side of the family. And so um, this uh, starts in, in Alsace where my mother's Alsatian um, uh, ancestors were in Germany because Alsace was bounced back and forth across Germany and France because of various treaties. Her family were in Germany and were allowed to return to France. Um, and then the older uncles went to um, Algeria, worked in the bauxite mines and then brought the rest of the family down. And then when they were there, then the, uh, the early relatives went to the US and prepared for that. And so, uh, my mother had, her, her, my, my grandmother's generation uh, were, were born on three continents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's... Yeah. And I didn't know this until you know, fairly recently. And so um, this actually began, this piece actually began as a, a prose poem. Uh, I, I find a lot of the work that I do starts in one genre and oftentimes finishes in another. Sometimes I'm, I'm writing something and I don't know yet how big it wants to be. And um, this actually grew out of, of this idea of, of not knowing who these relatives were and imagining them through reading about the cuisine in Alsace <laughs> in a French encyclopedia uh, of, of food. And so that really sets up You'll, you'll hear these, these strains running through this whole piece. So I, I'm gonna start this. This is out of Alsace. Always the hunger came to Monsieur Mesmer. Nightly, it visited his sleep where he dreamed of arriving in new lands, places where orchard rows filled with fruit and bees. Mornings he stood vaguely mesmerized regarding the transformation of an empty sky into a cumulus cloud as he sang his soon-to-be immigrant song. The taste for movement called to Madame, his wife, among lines of cabbage and tarragon, along rows of danjou pears, regaling her 
with its spun golden stories. She canned the future in tin lidded jars to survive when hope would become the new troubadour. Hunger's sweet mouth slipped seeds into her earbud, pasting leaves on fingertips and tongues spoke daily to the empty pod of her body. Monsieur Mesmer was one of the one in 10 in Alsace uh, who, was, who was French. The German occupiers gave them leave to leave. His native Strasbourg rode the border like a saddle, a horse balanced athwart a tightrope. He held the reins loosely, ready, reading the situation. Did Paris await his return? Would their fellow citizens open their arms like crucifixes or scarecrows? Can cities be caught as easily as fish or trains? The national narrative told tales of expatriates, but not episodes of those who emigrated. Men who go briefly will always be the prodigal sons welcomed back into the open arms upon returning. But men who leave for life look back to see arms folded over chests hard faces and fists. Monsieur unsaddled the piebald mare and changed nations like he would change trains. With brothers and babies, baggage and bottles of bon blanc, vin blanc, the Mesmers and their child, Emile, left Saint Marie aux Mines. My French is not very good. <laughs> Accompanied by Monsieur's brothers, Louis and Eloy. Together they took the crane, train across Spain and caught the British ferry from Gibraltar, arriving in Algiers, the mouth of Algeria, seeking the French enclave's sweet tongue and enfolding arms of common welcome. What did they miss? The smell of the farm fields wet with spring rains, vineyards and dairies, orchards and wineries, onion quiche, Snails and sauerkraut, the thé de foie gras, civet of hare with noodles. But the heat there was a buttoned navy wool coat. But the poppies withered in the bright garden. Monsieur Mesmer stood disruptively memorized, mesmerized, his eyes scanning a terrain of hourglass sand that made an ocean that surrounded them isolated as a French island in a sea of sand. For seven years, the brothers entered the earth's cool belly. Miners loading bauxite into carts on tracks, they pushed toward the bitter mouth of the mine, delivered by men pale as potatoes. Like a lightning flash, the sky blinded them. The brothers were given the common earnings and sailed toward the new land to look for new jobs, better pay, more opportunities in America. Monsieur Mesmer toiled and saved while Madame birthed two more children, children in the Arab Maghreb. How hard to sing of location when a parched throat arrives. It is debauched to a citizen in exile, a mime of a minor or stranger in the street, an expatriate at the turnstile, seven years of waiting, of wishing, of wanting, always the hunger whispered in their ears. The mesmer settled into steerage, the belly of the boat dark and close as a mine shaft. The Atlantic cradled the steamer in its crossing, swelling by white cap, by azores, by gull, by birthing woman, by breach, by stillborn. The ocean was handed the swaddled baby. Madame was heart cut and heart wet in the ocean spray, heart dry in the night when the prow with its, steer, in, its, its steerage where they rode rose like a swing and fell like a sledge, the clash of steel and wave vibrating in them. They were all of one belly, all of one loss. The baby's name was lost at sea. Monsieur Mesmer, arrived visibly mesmerized at the mouth of the Cuyahoga River. The family disembarked 
on a river bank of gritty industry cluttered with the sad shanty dwellings of the Irish town bend near where Moses Cleveland's ferry first crossed the crooked river that cleaved the land. But the reunited family spirit took them south to farmlands across the river valley, arriving in Berea. Lush fields of daisies and sassafras, maple and ash greeted them. Then orchards and vineyards, gardens and coops, cellar and barn and spring house, farmhouse. The dandelion taste of poverty left as spring came bearing gifts on warm st summer storm clouds, spinach and radish rhubarb and asparagus, trellised snap peas, and rouge de ver romaine lettuce. Together, the mesmers felt the dream lean against their foreheads like soft rain, the residual image of arrival wiping their faces. The next baby came to Madame in a dream of seed as her liminal waist became an opening door. Monsieur and Madame became Mr. and Mrs. as her open face experienced the transformation of an empty cask into a filled barrel as she sang of Caroline, first born in the new land child. The old uncles, Eloy and Louis Mesmer, sat in the kitchen of Caroline, Caroline Mesmer Higgins's house on Cleveland's near west side. They were playing cards and cursing in their native French. They laid down the aces and eights like sidewalk slates. Vin Blanc poured into juice glasses from which they economically sipped. The cigarettes came to them from their English speaking grandniece Genevieve, who rolled them for a penny each. They cut the face cards for a buck. Their grandniece, who was my mother, put the pennies in a small crystal vase that she set on the windowsill where the sunlight came into it like a worldly lover telling her stories of her bright future. Rooted in Ohio, I'm ensnared in its present moment. History, if I could summon you with incantations, paper the walls with my family tree, will you liberate me, feed me? These mesmers have hypnotized my lost past are strange to me. Gray faces and fading photographs of old world ancestors lost among the displaced and disappearing members of the grand narrative on my family on my mother's mother's side. How I miss you now, my Alsatian ancestors I never knew. Strasbourg, Nancy, Mulhausen, you who maintain ponds and developed pisciculture in Calmer, stuffed pike, frog leg soup, crayfish flan, blue trout, alvan. I would dine with you if I could. Listen to your immigration set stories over pate and plums, kugelhoff and kirch. Meeting you here on the page where I write, you family of Alsatian strangers. I raise glasses of sweet muscat and frambois. I toast you with Gewurztraminer, Pinot Gris and Riesling as the sunlight from the window illuminates our glasses, transforming them into incandescent lights shine upon the past, offering a prologue into the future. Wonderful. Wow, that's wonderful. wonderful. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'm so glad you read that. Thank I'm you. so glad you read that. Well, and 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 the ability to reimagine ancestry based on some facts yeah. that you have from yeah. oral history sure. is remarkable. What impresses me too is that you you tell the story through food. Yeah. And from the beginning to the end, <laughs> there, there's a lot, but there's food. Bonnie, yeah. you want to ask some questions or make some comments? Well, I, I too liked the food. It made me want to dine with <laughs> your ancestors. <laughs> very, very well done. And thank yeah. you. Very well done. Thank you. Yeah. 
And it, 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 it illustrates the, the immigrant journey so well. It does. It, that it's not one thing. It, it's, it's a lot more than that. And the struggle and yearning for not knowing. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I think that as a, as a country of, of, of immigrants, we, we have pieces, you know, it's like, it's like going through the, um, the pockets in a coat, that's your family history. And you set out the four or five things you have. And from there, those are the, the touchstones. And so in this, it was the journey across the continents. It was the, 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 the immigrant story, but also of the generations and the growth and the birth and how, how the families, I mean, the, the, the concept, that my, my grandmother's family, her, her generation, were born on three continents was just mm -hmm. stunning when I learned that story. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the things I knew then were some photographs, a few pages of family stories my mother had. And what I'd been reading um, about the, the cuisine from Alsace, and it's like, I wanted a taste of it. <laughs> you know, I wanted to, I looked on maps and I, I, I traced how they would have gotten there. Um, and, and then of course the arrival into coming in uh, through the Great Lakes, up the Cuyahoga, uh, in, into that area down there where all the immigrant boats came in. Um, and then going up on the hill and out toward Berea was the, the movement then from the water to the new land, literally the new land. Mm -hmm. And they farmed and they farmed after living seven years where, uh, or more where um, all it was was sand and nothing would grow. <laughs> it must have just felt like, you know, a, a new thing <laughs> to them, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, really, and, and I like the idea too that you, you did considerable research while writing this. Yes. And I think that's one of the things about nonfiction is that um, I start with some information. Sometimes I, I, I have, a, you know, I set my, my, my pieces on the table and then I do some research on them. And then as I start writing, I don't think about the research. I just write and then I come back and re-research it. And it's like layering it. It's like the layers of history that you, you, know, you dig up if you're doing archaeological digs. There's those layers you do. And so... Um, I find that really interesting. And, and the idea of the, the, the idea of food, the, the, the tactile nature of that, the taste of the past, you know, the, the taste of a family history. Um, <laughs> and my mother was Irish on my father's side. And I, I one time said, do you want to go to this Irish restaurant? She goes, I don't like Irish food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The food doesn't necessarily come with, with the... Uh... Uh, bloodlines no, no. I mean, that's the whole idea of what we hunger for and what what feeds us and what satisfies mm -hmm. us and the, the movement from being displaced french in germany and then arriving to france and then going to a place where basically it was a very um harsh dry uh, climate and then coming to america and being farmers in that world yeah. and, and, and the things yeah. they were growing they were growing those things there it's just remarkable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you. It's an American story, but I like I, I like the way you talk about the process because that's kind of what this is about. It's yeah, sure. expose people to to our stories, but also to expose people. You know, help people learn different writing processes, and yeah. we all got them. Yeah. Um, I guess one of my first questions is. When did you become a poet? Was there a moment or experience that actually created your desire to That's a poet? Really good question. Or... No, I, 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 was a, I was a kid who read, you know, I, I'd go to the library. I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a house where, where we had books. Uh, my mother read, she had a small library of her personal books. Um, the book I have on there about the, the library, the, A Boy Among Books, is, is a lot about that influence yeah, on me. I and I, I want, and in that piece, I was approaching the idea of how can I show myself immersed in that without understanding that there was something exceptional. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I thought everybody lived in a world of books. What did I know? Um, and um, that, that pull though is, is interesting because um, I didn't really grow up wanting to be a writer. You know, I had other ideas 
um, as kids do of what they want to do in life. Um, somewhere around the time I was 14 or 15, I, I, I discovered um, guitars and um, <laughs> I still play after all these years. It's, it's, so music has really been a thread that runs through what I'm doing. And I think that th there's a musicality in what I do. I'm very attuned to how things sound as opposed to the way they look. Okay. And like, um, you know, I, I, when I learned that uh, Rita Dove, when she's working on a poem and it isn't working, she gets out her cello and she plays until she finds the rhythm of it. And then she sets it down or the bow down and writes again, right? So there, there's, there, there's that influence where the music uh, runs through it. And um, I thought uh, I would try my hand at writing some songs when I was playing in some bands in high school. And I wasn't any good at it. I, you know, I, I don't have the rhyming gene, <laughs> okay? I'm just not wired that way, you know? Um, it's like, I don't memorize my own work because again, I'm not wired that way. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a, there, there, there's a coming, there was for me at different points in my life, this coming to this moment of awareness that says, well, of course you want to do that. That's a noble goal, but you're not wired to do that. <laughs> That's not how you're built. And so um, I, I, I showed some of this early work to some teachers I trusted one in fact who was an older brother of, of a close friend and and they were very encouraging they're saying well no they're not songs but you, I think you're writing poetry and then they were good enough to tell me some things about it and give me books to read give me books to read um it led me in the directions. And so uh, I, f I found then that, that writing poetry was an outlet for me. You know, like when I was, I was a stutterer when I was young too. And so I, I was awkward socially. And the guitar though, for a, an American adolescent, any musical instrument is an, another voice. It's this other voice you can use. I couldn't articulate, I didn't have the vocabulary to talk about, even to myself, of what I was going through, but I could play it. I could play it. I, I, I knew how to play angry. I knew how to play sad and soul. <laughs> I mean, but you do that though. It was, an, it was this extra voice for me. And so um, that movement then into writing poetry was a very logical thing for me to do. So there wasn't any direct um, impetus to wake up one day and say, I will become a poet. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't like that. It was like, it was like a process that, that it took me through. And then, um, but so, yeah, so the, so, and, and then I, I've always written, I, I, I've come to think that for me, writing isn't, is more than anything else about understanding myself and my relationship to the world in which I live. So I'm in now to the philosophical field here of epistemology. <laughs> what yeah. is, how do we process the ideas? How do, how, what is the truth? What are all those issues there? And then I started to progress beyond that because the poetry that I was eventually led, um, I did narrative poetry because I'd been trying to write song lyrics. So I wrote lyric poetry, but then um, I had uh, uh, an opportunity, at some point in my life, I. I had a colleague who introduced me to prose poetry and I got really interested in that. And I went to, as far as I know, the, one of the only prose poetry um, retreats that, that has been done in this country. And I got to work with Robert Bly and I worked with Russell Edson, who was a huge influence on my life. And I worked with Peter Johnson, who was a friend of mine now and uh, a, a really important figure in prose poetry. And so suddenly I was writing paragraphs on the page but it, every, it was all poetry it was just compressed into small mm -hmm. blocks mm -hmm. and I, I i i i said to my i said to my work on the page paragraphs i, I like you guys you, you, you give me <laughs> framework you know it's like and i started instead of thinking of line to line i began thinking of sentence to sentence and paragraph to paragraph or single paragraphs or sequences of paragraphs and that sequencing of things and those short freestanding units in poetry eventually became took me to lyric essays in nonfiction and the so-called braided essay mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. you know? And so that was kind of my evolution along the way. And along the way, I wrote a book of short stories because, well, I didn't actually write a book. I was writing short stories and then had an opportunity um, to get a book out in that. And I, and um, that was my training in writing prose. And then, so um, I, I didn't write uh, Ohio Apertures as a book. I just wrote a lot of pieces because I wanted to learn how to do it. Um, I had a friend who started a, a, a small online journal some years ago and um, he said, send me anything you want. <laughs> so I was like, I was doing play reviews. I was doing film reviews. The piece in the book about the, um, the Cleveland International Film Festival comes out of that. I was kind of like doing, you know, a little, I was playing the role of the reporter to a degree. Yeah. I was yeah. reporting on things, which was like one of my favorite um, nonfiction writers is my friend David Giffels at the University of Akron, who trained as, he worked for the Akron Beacon Journal <laughs> for a oh. long time. He came in the doorway of journalism, okay? And he did research books. He, he did a book on Devo. He did a book on rubber tires in Akron. Um, <laughs> a remarkable, a book. remarkable a whole book. Guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, for me then, when I moved into nonfiction, I had all these things to play with. You know, I, I knew what narrative prose poetry was, so I could write narrative nonfiction. I knew what uh, braided prose poetry was. I could easily move over into the braided essay. Um, uh, a number of these pieces began as prose poems, but I would discover that prose, you know, every genre gives me an opportunity to say things in a way I couldn't do it in another genre. Yeah. yeah. And so um, that's, that's been sort of my, my journey as a writer is to just keep adapting to new forms I encounter because I can say, things. I look back at my book of short stories and I, I, I looked at it recently. I'm, Boy, I wish I'd held these five back. They would have been great in this book. <laughs> <laughs> I was really kind of writing. Um, creative nonfiction, but I didn't know yeah. quite what it was. You know, I'd read it, but I hadn't really thought consciously about writing it as a form. And so I also had the discovery that happened to it, which is that I, I would write a poem and the poem wouldn't work. So I put it in that folder over there. And then when I started doing prose poetry, I went back to that folder and I go, oh, you're a prose poem. That's why you wouldn't work. <laughs> and so I had the same experience then with, um, writing of actual short stories, some of them were so so autobiographical that they really were pretty largely what became the impetus to move forward into nonfiction doing that. And um, everything opens up to something else. And so some of these pieces, when I first wrote them, they didn't really work as poems. So I try them as a prose poem. I go, well, that's better, but that still doesn't do it. Uh, but the opening piece in there about the kid on the, going on the roller coaster, I mean, that first paragraph was actually a standalone prose poem, pretty much written in response to a work of art for a project I, I was involved with at uh, um, the Cleveland Heights uh, Art Gallery. They, they brought writers in to write about the work. And so there, there's a long history of how that worked. But then as soon as I saw that, then I'm going, oh, the Great Lakes culture, of course, I know that. And so um, the, the movement of through forms is a way of not only opening up my understanding of myself and the world I'm in, but it's a constant opening up too of like, I go into a genre and I can open a door and go, oh, look what's in here, you know, like what I can do when I go into that room, that genre or that subgenre or that hybrid form is constantly a way of opening up the possibility of saying things, I guess I would say more precisely uh, yeah. th th yeah. than I've been able to do previously, maybe with a sharper focus, maybe with um, just the structure of what it allows me to do. Um, there's a couple things about what you're saying is partly the first of all that I I grew up thinking there was fiction, nonfiction, mm -hmm. poetry. There were three mm -hmm. separate things. And what you're saying is representative of what, is, of what I think is happening is that they're all kind of coming together yeah, they are. in a variety of ways, which is a positive thing. Oh, it um, is, absolutely. Sure. They have poets writing essay and creative nonfiction pieces. Yeah. yeah. And to have people writing nonfiction that models fiction. So that's what yeah. creative nonfiction is generally, you know, you're using yeah. techniques of fiction to write yeah. stories. Yeah. 
I just, I think it's wonderful now that we're not three separate groups. We're just writers. We don't and want to. You're doing all of them. Yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to embrace it as the tyranny of genre. <laughs> they, should be, they should be blocks we rebuild. Right. For. Yes. Yeah. It's just one of the reasons so many people are afraid of poetry. Oh, yeah, because sure. Because the poets are, you know, they're on this pedestal. Poets are people who have a neurosis about the right margin. <laughs> like that. Okay, right halfway that. over there, they go oh, back to the left. That know? is so good, Bonnie. Do you want to add anything or, or ask any a question regarding? Uh, no, I'm just fascinated um, yeah. with the concept. I uh -huh. think most of us as writers have encountered uh, similar challenges with oh, sure. uh, mm -hmm. one genre or another. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, because they all have their sort of. Um, pre-established um these are the guidelines for the genre you know but that's all breaking down it's just getting porous and it's merging together mm -hmm. or you get those overlap areas where uh you can write somebody asked um uh, um i can't think of this guy's name suddenly uh i can't think of his name but um some he, he was talking about one time about the different he said well there's you know there's there's um there, there, there's these little paragraph prone poems you do these paragraph things and then you have these pieces that are flash fictions you know oh, yeah. sometimes they look the same and someone asks <laughs> well how do you know which one's po which one is 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 fiction a flash fiction and which one is a narrative and he said well you always know it's a story because someone yearns for something yes oh that's good that's good yeah and uh -huh. I, I, I just can't think of this guy's name right now. Um, his book, his first oh, book. Robert Owen, Owen, Owen Butler, Butler said that. I think Robert That's Owen Butler. Butler. Owen yeah. Butler, yes, absolutely, yes. I yes. can be smart today. What's that? <laughs> I can be smart today. <laughs> Yay! You know, it's funny. I, I, I was just going to the title of the book. I remember titles of books more more than the names of people who yeah. write them. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yearning thing is is that if if any if if all people trying to write get the yearning part, that's half. Ha, you're halfway there. Well, in the piece I read today is totally about yearning. Oh, really? <laughs> Completely. Yeah. I want to go back to to two quick things here. Um, before they get away. One is the idea that like, I think people experience writer's block because they're stuck in a genre. <laughs> oh, oh. And if you, if you, you know, we say first idea is the best idea. I, I don't think always first genre is the best genre. Yeah. And yeah. so I think one way to, 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 to break out of the block is to set it aside, read something, uh, or try writing in another genre. If your poem's not working, collapse it to a prose poem, see what happens. And you go, look, yes. I get a prose poem. And you go, well, wait, this person yearns. Maybe it's a flash fiction. <laughs> <laughs> the other person I want to mention is a guy named Alexander Heyman, who uh, uh, is from one of the Balkan countries. I can't remember which one it is. He does some collaborative work with uh, uh, Colin McKean, who's one of my favorite favorite wow. prose writers, uh, Transatlantic and Dancer are some of the most beautiful story, short book novels I've ever read. And he's such a stylist. He's so amazing. Heyman said in an interview, he said, somebody was asking about the issue between, you know, we're novel. Your, 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 your fiction seems really autobiographical and your nonfiction seems really fictional. And he said, oh, oh, that's right. He said, you have two words, but he said, we don't have a word for nonfiction. Oh, we don't have that in our language, in our culture. Everything is just a story. Yes. It doesn't matter if it's true or partly true or totally fabricated. It's a story. And I thought, oh, how liberating that must be to Isn't it? and have to deal with that. Well, may, maybe our, our listeners, our YouTube listeners, will feel liberated today. You've given us all sorts of uh, almost bu bumper sticker for the writer's <laughs> bumpers. Sentiment, here, here, you know, here, here. it's not. Everybody, here's my web page where to order those bumper stickers. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. Do you have a web page that you want to tell us about? What's that? 
Do you have a web page you want to tell us about? No, I was making a joke about. Oh, this. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but no, you you there have been so many little zingers in this that I I've, I've really I've appreciated that are either affirming to me or uh, uh, surprising. I think craft is is something that if I gained anything by, I didn't, I didn't do an MFA program. They didn't have them when I was learning to write. We would just read books. And, you know, I was fortunate to be at a small school that had a writer's club. They'd had one for a long time. And I, I met, I met Richard Haig there who blurbed my book and, um, and Bob Collins. And I work with some really fine young writers and we've, we've kept in touch. And, uh, um, there, there, there's something there about this idea of, of communities of things too. When we talk about our writers communities, there's genre communities too, you know, like I, <laughs> there, I, 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 know, I, I have a, a community of friends who are poets. I have a community of friends who are fiction writers or nonfiction writers. Some of them who do multi genres. Um, and once we get talking, it doesn't really matter. We're all yeah. really always talking about the craft of writing, mm -hmm. but in teaching, in a creative writing program, um, I found myself teaching craft and theory classes, which every one of those organizing and researching those classes was like teaching myself as I would be going in and doing it, you know, and I was finding some great textbooks. So I was teaching courses on hybrid writing and um, whew, prose poetry. I would do these courses on, you know, I think I called one small stuff or something. Oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, it was like, we're going to just look at all the things we can do really small. And for young writers, my point was, well, first of all, you learn how to really polish a paragraph. You learn how to really polish it small. Yeah. You're going to do, you, you, that's what you have to do the whole book. <laughs> you got to polish it all like that one. <laughs> uh, but, but the other part of it was just about making kind of that a, a part of the whole mindset between the I'm going to revise it and I'm going to edit it. There's that whole question then of like, what is the craft I'm working in? And if I, if I only see this as the limitations of the genre, that's all I can see to address yeah, it. Yeah, but if yeah. I begin to recognize the fact that like, if some cultures don't even make a distinction between the two, why should I care so much about that? And suddenly that brings, that, that opens the whole mm -hmm. picture of how mm -hmm. you look at your own work. And so, yeah, this book of mine, I was, I can look at this and go, I can tell you what I was experimenting with every time. I think <laughs> I look back on my own work, I, I can always see that everything was a puzzle I, I posed for myself. How do I do this thing? And I would try it and I go, that's not working. So the next question is, how then do I go beyond this? What, what other place can I go? Well, I'll walk around it and I'll stand, I'll stand over there and look at it, or I'll, I'll, it's like putting a chessboard on the floor and standing up and playing, or instead of looking across the game, yeah. you're looking down. down. On. Yeah. And so those perspectives are so um, helpful. And a lot of that's just really understanding our relationship with craft. And the more we learn about craft, I think the better we become as craftspeople. Yeah. Because, you know, yes, writing is, is a literary art. Yes, it, 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 it's, it's highly inspired. And it is on the, on the creative part, but so much of what we do to finish it is the, the critical thinking aspect and the more we learn about craft, the better critics we become of our own work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Spoken like a true professor. Thank you. <laughs> so we're, we're gonna wrap this up and Bonnie, um, any other questions uh, that you have? Uh, I can't think of any other than, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm still trying to take it taken all that you've said um, that has resonated so well um, in such good information and good suggestions. Good. So, so thank, what, you. thank you. And what would you say to our audience right now as we close this YouTube video? Any words of wisdom, final words of wisdom to our audience? Don't forget to read as much as you can. That's it. <laughs> that, that, that's the thing. Our previous uh, poet we interviewed said her four-word philosophy is read, look, write, breathe. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the looking part, people forget about that. That That's a valuable part. So 
I've had so much time to read in the last year. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it and, wonderful? <laughs> well, and and uh, uh, when I retired, uh, Molly and I sold our house and we, we did a, two years of, of going to writing residencies or Airbnbs and we stayed in Quebec City in an Airbnb in the middle of winter. There's a whole story there, uh, <laughs> but just to, to travel and go places. And, and then when we finally bought a house and moved in August, uh, in, in October, we were settling into, we were frustrated because all our books were in storage. Oh. <laughs> so we bought the house and then we just opening book, box and this one, oh, I went this one you know, oh, so yes. like, and reading old friends or picking up books mm -hmm. that like now suddenly have, you know how it is, the book doesn't change, we change. Uh -huh. <laughs> going through books that I, I might have had an interest in, but it just didn't catch me at the time. I, I'm reading a lot of Jim Harrison right now, um, who is a, a great writer, but I'm reading a book of his nonfiction and I'm like, his voice is just so amazing and his, 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 his sense of what a sentence can do. And like, he, he well, he's a poet. I can see Bonnie's writing this down. Bon Bonnie writes all these things down on a regular basis. When everybody, she's she's a she's a book woman of of uh, the East End of Louisville or um, Greater. But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I want to thank you for for taking the time to come to us thank today you thank you, on really. Zoom, yeah. and we hope to see you again. Yes, yes. Good luck. Good luck with the sale of your book. Thank you. Thank you very much. And many more yes. Zoom meetings to you. Thank you. And best to you with your writing, both of you. Oh, yes, we need that, too. You've encouraged us. Thank you. Thank you.